Welcome to the History of English podcast, a podcast about the history of the English language. This is episode 43, Anglo-Saxon Monsters and Mythology. Last time, we looked at the early history of Scandinavia and the historical background of Beowulf. This time, we're going to explore the other aspect of Beowulf, the monsters and supernatural elements of the story. And that's what really tends to fascinate most modern readers. And we're going to use Beowulf as a jumping-off point to explore the monsters and mythology of the Anglo-Saxons, as well as the early Vikings. Remember that both groups shared a common Germanic language, and that included a lot of mythology. So by the time the Vikings arrived in Britain, the Anglo-Saxons had largely converted to Christianity. So those two worldviews clashed during that later period. But before we begin, let me remind you that the website for the podcast is historyofenglishpodcast.com. And you can always reach me directly by email at kevin at historyofenglishpodcast.com. And the Beowulf series is coming along as well. I hope to have it ready within the next two to four weeks. That series will explore the poem, the story, the history, and the language of the poem. But before we move on from Beowulf, there's one key aspect of that poem which I wanted to explore here in the podcast. And that's the way in which the poem reflects the Anglo-Saxon view of monsters and mythology. In fact, as we'll see, the poem has probably survived the centuries in large part because it's a monster story. So let's start with Beowulf, specifically the name Beowulf. It's very tempting to assume that the name Beowulf refers to some type of wolf. In fact, wolf is a very common part of Anglo-Saxon names. It appears in the names of kings like Ethelwolf, which was noble wolf. It also appears in the name of an early Anglo-Saxon poet, who we haven't discussed yet, named Cunewulf. It also appears in the popular Anglo-Saxon name Wolfstan. In fact, this was a common element in Germanic names. We still have it in the German name Wolfgang. And Wolf was once the original ending of modern names like Adolf and Rudolf. So it isn't really surprising that Beowulf uses that same ending. But the name Beowulf is unknown in Anglo-Saxon Britain outside of this particular poem. So it's generally believed that the name is a poetic compound, which remember are sometimes called kennings. The first thing to understand is that wolf didn't necessarily mean wolf. It was often used as a descriptive term to mean hunter. So because wolves were considered ravenous hunters, it was just a euphemism for hunter. So if the poet used the term wolf as hunter, what was he hunting? In other words, what was Beo? Well, it's generally believed that Beo meant bee, as in honeybee. So Beowulf was the bee hunter. And what animals hunt honeybees? Well, animals that want honey, specifically bears. So Beowulf, or bee hunter, is considered to be a poetic compound which meant bear a large, powerful creature which resembles a human, especially if it's standing on its hind legs. And, of course, the character of Beowulf is a man with superhuman strength who grabs monsters with his bare hands and rips their arms off. Now, there was another implied connection between wolves and bears in Germanic mythology. Their warriors were often formed into war bands that are sometimes called wolf cults or bear cults. Within the early Germanic tribes, powerful leaders emerged, which were supported by loyal groups of warriors. The warriors were bound together by sworn allegiances to a common leader, and those war bands evolved into raiding parties. You might remember that the Romans had built the Saxon shore defenses along the British coast to deal with raiders from the North Sea long before the Anglo-Saxon invasions began. So these types of raiding bands had been around for a long time, and within the Norse culture, these groups evolved into the early Viking raiding parties. A term developed within German for these types of warrior bands, the term is Mannerbund, which is literally man-bond, but it meant a war band of men. Each tribe had one of these war bands to defend itself against similar war bands from other tribes. As tribes grew over time, the Mannerbund became the most elite warriors within the tribe. In Old Norse, a member of this group was called a Svein, which is the source of the common Scandinavian name Sven. It's also cognate with the word Sib, which gives us the modern English word sibling. So these war bands were like brothers. 
an early version of the term Band of Brothers. But this development wasn't unique to the Germanic tribes. Even when we looked at the original Indo-Europeans, we saw evidence that they routinely engaged in raiding. And much of that raiding was conducted by similar war bands. And those same types of war bands existed in most early tribal cultures. But within the early Germanic culture, certain traditions and mythologies began to emerge around those war bands. One of those was the animal cult, in which warriors wore animal hides or skins. Sometimes they wore wolf skins, and sometimes they wore bear skins. Those war bands followed and worshipped Woden. If they died in battle, they went to his heavenly hall in the sky, Valhalla. And in Germanic mythology, Woden had two giant wolves as pets. And in that same mythology, Woden is ultimately destined to be swallowed or consumed by a giant wolf. So these wolf cults derive from the association of Woden with wolves. Since they wore wolf skins, they resembled wolves. But there was more to it than that. The warrior cults had very sophisticated and harsh initiation rites. In Germanic mythology, Woden had experienced his own type of initiation when he hanged himself from a tree with a spear wound. So the initiation rites for these new members often included being stabbed by spears and even hanged from trees until the warrior passed out. This was called a little death. These initiations were designed to toughen the young warriors and form tight bonds between them. But there was also a mythological component. It was believed that these types of rituals created a special type of war ecstasy. It was designed to develop a special mental state in which they lost all fear and actually became consumed by the battle itself. In addition to wolf cults, there were also bear cults in which members wore bear skins or bear shirts. In Old Norse, a bear shirt was a berserker, and that was the origin of the famous berserkers. And in battle, they worked themselves into such a frenzy that they actually felt that they were invulnerable. And that Old Norse word gave us the modern English word berserk. That berserker rage was fostered by those early initiation rites. And the wolf cults used the same process and had many of the same beliefs. And it was believed that these various warriors could actually transform themselves into wild animals like bears or wolves in battle. They didn't just fight like wild animals, they actually became wild animals. So there was a spiritual aspect of this process. And it was believed that the man's soul would actually leave his body. And in its place, a wild animal would take over. And the soul would return to the body when the fight was over and the animal left. And this is believed to be the ultimate origin of the concept of the werewolf. Literally, the man-wolf. The man who's transformed into a wolf. Werewolves were feared throughout the Germanic world and beyond. And it was tied to this idea of the human soul leaving the body and it being replaced with that of an animal. And we'll come back to this concept in a moment. But I wanted to note the connections here between bears and wolves, and that name, Beowulf. It wasn't a common name. As I noted, it doesn't appear in any Old English text other than the poem Beowulf. But remember that it meant bee wolf, and it was a compound word, which meant bee hunter or bear. So that name Beowulf had imagery of both wolves and bears, and wolves and bears were closely associated with Germanic and Norse warriors. So there was an implied meaning in that name which isn't really obvious to modern English speakers. By the way, the tradition of wearing bear skins was eventually limited to simply wearing bear skin hats. And that tradition spread throughout much of Northern Europe. And even to this day, tall bear skin hats are still worn by royal guards in Britain and other European countries. And even in the U.S., marching bands are sometimes led by a drum major who wears a similar bear skin hat. But this tradition can ultimately be traced back to the Germanic tribes in those early bear cults and war bands. Now, as I noted, the idea that a soul could leave its body and be replaced by an animal was a fundamental belief within Germanic culture. But sometimes the soul actually took physical form and existed separate from the original body. And the one thing you didn't want to do if your soul left your body was to meet the other version of yourself. If you did, it was considered a premonition of death. Sometimes the soul took the appearance of a woman. This was common in the northern tradition. In one later Icelandic saga, a man named Thorgils 
is riding with his men to the assembly called the Thing. Along the way, he meets a large woman who starts screaming at him and his men. And as he approaches her, she dodges around him. And he doesn't realize it at the time, but the woman is really his disembodied soul in the form of a woman. And soon afterward, Thorgils is killed by an axe. So that's the northern tradition. But in the southern Germanic regions, it was more common for the disembodied soul to appear as a clone who looked just like the original person. We actually have the German word for this clone scenario in modern English. It's the word doppelganger, which is literally double goer. And this idea of an alter ego has passed down into European literature. And we still have a version of it in modern TV and movies and literature with the idea of the evil twin. And these ideas of the disembodied soul and the doppelganger are found in many later Scandinavian sources. And in some of these stories, we can actually find similarities and parallels to Beowulf. And scholars think that some of those Scandinavian stories and the Beowulf story actually share some common roots. It's unlikely that the later Scandinavian stories were actually influenced by the Beowulf poem itself, because Beowulf was composed in Britain, and there are not any references to the poem within Britain during the Old English period, or even the Middle English period. So any similarities between Beowulf and the Scandinavian stories had to have come from an earlier common source. One Danish legend, which is believed by many to derive from the same roots as Beowulf, is the story of Hrolf Kraki, a Danish king who's believed to be the same person as Hrothulf in Beowulf. In both stories, he's identified as the nephew of the old Danish king Hrothgar. He's also identified as the nephew of Hrothgar in that poem Widsith, which I discussed in an earlier episode. So he's well documented. But he's only mentioned in passing in Beowulf and Widsith. But in this later Danish legend, he's the actual focus of the story. In the Danish legend, the nephew is now the king of the Danes, having succeeded his uncle at some point. And he finds himself in battle with his brother-in-law, who's trying to seize the throne. And the legend says that the king's bravest fighter was named Bodvar Bjarki. And many scholars think that this figure of Bjarki is derived from the same original source as the character of Beowulf. So we might say that the two characters are cognate, in the sense that they both may have derived from the same original legendary figure. And that's because there are some strong parallels between the two stories. Just as Beowulf fights on behalf of the Danish king Hrothgar against several monsters, Bjarki fights on behalf of the Danish king Hroth against the people who are trying to usurp the throne. And there are also parallels in the names Beowulf and Bjarki. We established that Beowulf is an Anglo-Saxon compound word which meant bee hunter or bear. Well, the name Bjarki means little bear. So Beowulf and Bjarki actually have the same meaning. But there's more to it than that. In the Danish legend, in the decisive battle against the usurpers, a bear suddenly appears beside the king, Hroff, and the bear decimates the opposing fighters, in much the same way that Beowulf decimates his opponents in the Beowulf poem. But at the exact same moment that the bear appears, Bjarki disappears, and he's found later sitting in the hall, tired and sleepy. He's encouraged to go back and join the battle, but when he does so, the bear disappears and the tide of the battle ends up shifting to the other side. So in this story, we not only see a possible connection to the Beowulf story, we also see an apparent example of a warrior taking the form of a wild animal. And in the process, we see the soul of the warrior becoming disembodied and forming a type of doppelganger. So, these ideas were a fundamental part of the Germanic warrior culture. These ideas also persist in modern ghost stories, which sometimes describe an image of a person appearing in one place around the same time that the person dies in a completely different place. The idea of a disembodied soul also exists in the German word Geist, which was originally a soul that had been dispatched by sorcery and appeared in a frightful form. Old English had its own version of the word geist, which was ghost, and that word survives in modern English as the word ghost. The German version of the word gave us poltergeist, literally a noisy ghost. But German also developed a more general sense for the term, meaning 
the part of a person's nature or inner being that we can't see or touch. So it basically meant a person's spirit. And in that context, it gave us the word zeitgeist, which is literally time spirit or spirit of the age, basically the general attitude or spirit of a group of people during a particular period of time. And very much like German, English also developed a more general sense of that term. Now, since Gast typically referred to a scary spirit, it produced words like aghast, originally meaning terrified. And it also produced ghastly, which meant frightening. Beowulf also uses the term Gast to refer to the monster, Grendel. Early in the poem, he's referred to as Seelen Gast, which is literally the bold ghost or the bold spirit. And later he's referred to as Segrima Gast, literally the grim ghost or the grim spirit. So, as we've seen, the Germanic tribes routinely mixed supernatural elements into their warrior culture. And like many ancient cultures, they both feared and embraced the supernatural. They sometimes tried to control it. They relied upon magical rites to ensure good luck and good fortune. Magical rituals were also used for protection against diseases or to cure diseases. And this type of magic is commonly known as sorcery, but the words magic and sorcery are both French words brought to Britain by the Normans. The Anglo-Saxons used other words to describe this process of using magic to control the world around them. One word was thrucraft, derived from the name of the native Celtic Druids who routinely conducted magical rituals. So, thrucraft was the craft or skill of the Druids. And in an earlier episode, I mentioned that a song could be enchanting and could send someone into a, a trance-like state. And a song was sometimes called a gale, as in nightingale. So, another Old English word for magic or sorcery was galdercraft, which meant the singing craft. Of course, thrucraft and galdercraft have both disappeared from English. But there was another Old English word for sorcery which has survived into modern English. That word was witchcraft, or witchcraft, today. As its name suggests, witchcraft was the craft of the witcha, or the wicca. The female version was witcha, and the male version was wicca. The ultimate origin of those words is uncertain, but they were apparently derived from a common Germanic word because similar forms of those words appear in other Germanic languages. The original Germanic word had the K sound near the end, as in the male version, wicca, spelled W-I-C-C-A. But the ending changed for a female. It became W-I-C-C-E. And remember that in Old English, the sound of the letter C changed when it appeared before a front vowel like E. It shifted from its original K sound to the CH sound. That goes back to our discussion of the letter C. So, when the ending of the word changed from A to E, the pronunciation of the letter C changed from K to CH. So, from WICA to WICHA. But again, those are just the male and female versions of the same word. In recent decades, there's actually been a revival of some of these pagan beliefs and traditions. There are modern-day practitioners of what's known as Wicca, and that term is actually borrowed from the original Old English word Wicca, and the practitioners still call themselves witches. And Wicca also produced the modern English word wicked, so a wicked witch is really kind of redundant. Another example of this same type of sound shift can be found in the words wake and watch. Both come from the same root word. Wake retains the original K sound of the Old English word waken, meaning to arise or awake. If you were a guard, you had to stay awake at night to keep an eye on any threatening activity. This state of being awake was called wacha, and it produced the modern English word watch, as in to keep watch. So the same vowel change at the end of the word produced the same sound change. Now I gave this example of wake and watch. For a reason, some scholars think that all four of those words, wika, witch, wake, and watch, are all derived from the same root word. And the proposed connection is the fact that witchcraft sometimes involved waking the dead. So waken was to become awake, and wikian was to practice witchcraft. 
And if that connection seems a little odd, when someone died, it was customary to have a wake, when someone would stay awake and keep watch for dead spirits. So wake and watch had an inherent association with death and dead bodies. So that's one theory regarding the origin of Wicca and witch. Another word for witch in Old English was hagtesa. It ultimately produced the modern word hag, as in an old hag. But there's something very interesting about that word hagtesa. The first part, hag, is cognate with and closely related to the word hedge. The second part, tesa, is believed to mean fairy or flying demon. Both Old Norse and Old High German had similar words, and they all literally translate as hedge flyer or hedge rider. So it's someone who flies or rides along the hedges, which is very similar to the later notions of witches flying around on brooms. By the way, since we're talking about witches, I should note that the medieval Latin word for witch was masca, and it ultimately produced the word mascado meaning a charm or sorcery. And that word came into English as mascot, meaning a person or thing which brings good luck. So if you have a favorite sports team, the mascot isn't just a person dressed in a funny costume. It was originally a good luck charm. And the word mascot is derived from a Latin word meaning sorcerer or witch. But let's go back to Old English. And obviously, the word witch has survived from Old English, but the male version, wicca, didn't survive, except as the name for the modern pagan religion. The word Wicca gradually gave way to the word wizard in Middle English. And the root of wizard should be familiar to you if you listen to the most recent bonus episode. Wizard developed in Middle English out of the word wise. A wizard was a wise person. The original sense of the word survives when we describe someone as a wizard at math or science. It also survives in the term whiz, as in a whiz kid. But over time, the term wizard took on a more specific meaning. The wisdom of the wizard was reflected in his ability to see into the future. And this ultimately led to the sense of the word as someone who possessed magical or supernatural powers. Another word for a male witch is warlock. And warlock is also ultimately derived from Old English, but it didn't mean a male witch until about the 16th century. Warlock originally meant an oath-breaker in Old English. War was originally wer, and it meant oath or vow. And lock is derived from the same Germanic word which gives us words like lie and liar. So a warlock was an oath-liar or oath-breaker. By the end of the Anglo-Saxon period, it was being used as a euphemism for the devil. From there, it came to mean someone who was in league with the devil. In other words, a sorcerer or wizard. Now, initially, witchcraft was an accepted practice. But as Christianity spread, the two belief systems started to come into conflict. I've noted in earlier episodes that King Alfred, known as Alfred the Great, was one of the most important figures in the history of English. He was the Anglo-Saxon king from Wessex who finally stemmed the tide of the Viking invasions. He secured the homeland of the Anglo-Saxons, and he put a major emphasis on preserving the English language. But Alfred never ruled all of England. The Danish descendants of the Vikings still controlled the area known as the Danelaw in eastern and northern England. So Alfred signed a treaty with the Danish king there. We'll look at these developments in more detail in a future episode. But for now, it's important to understand that that treaty required the Danish king to convert to Christianity. And together, Alfred and the Danish king issued a set of laws which theoretically covered all of England, the English regions and the Danish regions. And those laws were some of the first laws to specifically outlaw witchcraft. Issued around the year 890, the law reads as follows in modern English. If witches or diviners, perjurers or morth workers or foul, defiled, notorious adulteresses be found anywhere within the land. Let them be driven from the country, and the people cleansed. Or let them totally perish within the country, unless they desist, and the more deeply make boat. In other words, make amends or make reparations. By the way, boat largely disappeared from English in this sense, 
but it survives in the phrase to boot, meaning moreover, as in my car wouldn't start and I missed a train to boot. Now these particular laws against witchcraft applied specifically to women, not men. So it applied to witches, but not Wicca or wizards or warlocks. And it reflected an attempt by the Christian authorities to weed out witchcraft. We've seen before that a standard test for identifying a witch was called an ordeal. That was an old Germanic term, and it gave us the modern English word ordeal, meaning a difficult experience. One type of ordeal was placing a suspected witch's hand in hot water to see if blisters occurred. And that's the ultimate origin of the phrase to be in hot water or find yourself in hot water to mean get into trouble. Now, I noted that Alfred's laws used the word boat, which exists today in the phrase to boot. But those laws also used another term, which you probably have never heard before. The term was morth workers. Specifically, the law says that it applies to, quote, witches or diviners, perjurers or morth workers, end quote. Well, morth was an Old English word which meant death. So the term morth worker meant someone who worked or consulted with the dead. Basically, it meant a spiritualist. And that might make sense because we have words like mortal and morbid in modern English, which also relate to death. And all of those words are cognate. Both mortal and morbid come from the Latin version of the word, which we got from French. Morth was the Germanic version of the same Indo-European root word. In Old English, when a person was killed unlawfully, it was morther. It didn't become murder until the Normans arrived, because their version of the same word was mordra, and that ultimately gave us the modern English version of the word, murder. And since we're talking about death, I should note that the words death and dead come from Old English, where they essentially had the same spelling and meaning as today. But the word die, D-I-E, was borrowed from the Vikings, which had a related but slightly different word. And to describe the process of dying, the Anglo-Saxons sometimes used the word stervan, which ultimately gave us the modern word starve. So we've seen that witchcraft was associated with raising the dead and also with conjuring the spirits of the dead. Well, it was also believed that witches could impose curses. And one specific type of curse, which Anglo-Saxons feared the most, was a curse on livestock. Since healthy livestock was a key to survival, any threat to the health or well-being of livestock was taken very seriously. In Old English, a curse on livestock was called a blasting. And if something was blasted, it was cursed or blighted. That word still survives in the word blast. And the connection appears to be the fact that curses were often imposed by a blowing or puffing action in the direction of the person or thing being cursed. So today, we tend to use the word blast in the sense of an explosion. But the original use of the word, in the sense of a curse, has survived in one context, where it refers to someone who's not in their normal state of mind. So when we say that someone who's drunk or stoned is blasted, we're using the term in a way that's based on its original meaning. Now, to counteract a blasting or curse, people would burn a fire to ward off evil spirits. In Old English, the fire was called a nadefjur, and they would sometimes take blood from sick cows or other livestock and boil it to get rid of the curse or evil spirits. Now, the Anglo-Saxons not only thought livestock diseases were caused by curses, they also thought sickness in general was caused by evil spirits who literally sucked the health out of animals and people. This was an old Germanic belief that was actually common in many parts of Europe. It ultimately led to the idea of the vampire, the creature that sucks the blood of the living. There are some scholars who actually believe that suck and sick are ultimately cognate. They argue that the word sick derives from the same word that produced suck because sickness was thought to result from demon sucking. One type of sickness, which was believed to be caused by evil spirits, was mental sickness or insanity. The Old English word for insane was giddy, a word which still exists in modern English. But today it means silly, or foolish, or impulsive. In Old English, Giddy had an underlying sense of being possessed by spirits, 
This belief wasn't unique to the Anglo-Saxons, however. The Greeks had the same general idea, which was called entheos, and it meant God inside or possessed by God. It later produced the words enthusiasm and enthusiastic. So enthusiastic and giddy both originally meant possessed by either spirits or God. It was also believed that evil spirits possessed people while they were sleeping. This type of spirit was called amara. By the time of Middle English, the word mara was used to describe the experience of being possessed by an evil spirit while sleeping. It was called a nicht mara, or as we know it today, a nightmare. And shortly after the Normans arrived, they gave English two other words for a demon or spirit which appears while someone is sleeping. Those words were incubus and succubus, both of which appeared in English within a century or so after the Norman conquest. Another word for an evil spirit is demon, which is another word that came into English via Latin and the Normans, and ultimately from Greek. And it was another very early borrowing from Latin in the first century after the Normans arrived. So apparently English speakers were intrigued by these new words for evil spirits. The Anglo-Saxons had called an evil spirit a devil or devil, and they also called it a fiend, which still exists in modern English. In fact, fiend was the preferred term used by the Beowulf poet. He called Grendel a fiend from hell. Now, I mentioned that spirits sometimes took over the body at night, or appeared in dreams at night. Well, the word dream has a strange history. The use of the word dream, as a vision one has while sleeping, goes back to the early Middle English period. But it wasn't a new word at that time. The word dream is well attested in Old English. But during the Old English period, it was always used to mean joy, merriment, or music. And scholars are not sure why the meaning changed from joy in Old English to sleeping visions in early Middle English. One theory is that the Anglo-Saxons did also use the term dream to refer to sleeping visions, but that use simply doesn't exist in any of the surviving text which we have today. So it might have been a secondary meaning which isn't really documented in the surviving Old English manuscripts. The other theory is that the modern sense of the word came from the Vikings. As we've seen before, the Vikings brought their own words which were often very similar to the native Old English words. And sometimes, the Norse version of the word replaced the English version. Old Norse had the word draumer, which meant an illusion or deception. And it's believed that this led to the modern use of the word dream, which is something that seems real but really isn't. But that Norse word draumer was cognate with another Norse word, draugr. And that word is important to our discussion because it meant a ghost or apparition. So again, it meant something that seemed like a real person, but wasn't a real person. Within Scandinavian folklore, the draugr could mean a ghost, but it was also used to mean an animated corpse. It was a dead person who had a grievance and roamed around at night seeking vengeance. So think zombies and walking dead. But unlike a zombie, a draugr could speak, and it was usually angry. Another type of animated corpse was a vampire which is a Slavic word meaning witch. And the most famous vampire is Dracula. So was Dracula a draugr? Well, they're both living corpses. But despite the similar names, there doesn't appear to be a linguistic connection between Dracula and draugr. However, Dracula is cognate with the word dragon. And dragon takes us back to Beowulf, because a dragon was one of the three creatures or monsters featured in the story. So, I want to transition from our look at Anglo-Saxon spirits and witches and sorcery, and I want to turn to Anglo-Saxon monsters, because ultimately, Beowulf is a good old-fashioned monster story. And in fact, that may be why the poem survived all those centuries. Many scholars today think that the poem may have been preserved primarily because it was a monster story. The manuscript which contains Beowulf actually contains five different texts. Beowulf is the fourth text in the book. Unfortunately, parts of the first and last text are missing, presumably due to wear and tear over the centuries before the book was rescued from that fire in Sir Robert Cotton's library in the 18th century. The first three texts are all prose pieces, 
So they're written in normal Old English speech, not poetry. And based upon the particular handwriting styles and scripts used by the scribes, scholars have determined that all three of those texts were copied by the same scribe. The next text, the fourth text, was Beowulf. And that same scribe copied the first two-thirds of that poem. But then a second scribe took over. The last portion of the Beowulf poem and what survives of the fifth and final text were written by this second scribe. He used a distinct script, and he had a different handwriting style, and his spellings were sometimes different from those of the first scribe. But here's the key. All four of the works which the first scribe copied, the first four texts in the book, including the majority of Beowulf, all concern monsters or unusual creatures. The first text is a life of St. Christopher, who's described as having a dog's head and being almost 20 feet tall. The next text is called The Wonders of the East, and it also contains many monsters, including dragons. The third text is entitled Letter of Alexander the Great to Aristotle, and it describes a great battle between men and water monsters. And then we have Beowulf and his battles against monsters and dragons. The final piece is a fragment of a poem called Judith, and it's really the only work which doesn't specifically concern monsters. But it was also added by that second scribe, so it isn't clear if it was originally intended to be part of the collection. So some scholars have concluded that either the first scribe, or perhaps both scribes, selected those first four works for preservation because they were all about monsters. And it's also believed that that may be why the manuscript survived the centuries. For some reason, this particular manuscript was selected for safekeeping when so many other Old English texts were burned and destroyed over the centuries. And it may have been kept by various collectors over the years because of its association with monsters. In fact, there's an interesting connection here between the Beowulf manuscript and another book compiled by Anglo-Saxon scribes called Liber Monstrorum which is Latin for Book of Monsters. As its name indicates, it's a catalog of monsters and marvelous creatures, and it was composed in Britain. But as was the general custom, it was written in Latin. It's believed that the book was originally composed in the late 600s or early 700s. So as we've seen before, this is the same general time frame in which many scholars think Beowulf was originally composed. It's in that narrow window after the introduction of Christianity and before the arrival of the Vikings. The original Liber Monstrorum was copied several times over the centuries. And the book purports to be a summary of all the monsters and creatures known to the author during his time. The basic idea of the summary is to determine whether the monsters are actually real or not. Mixed in with the monsters and supernatural creatures are real-life creatures in faraway lands which the author had heard about, but he couldn't confirm. It includes a description of an elephant and a rhinoceros, among other animals who lived in faraway places. So it's fascinating to see the writings of an author who had heard stories of all these creatures, but he can't discern which ones are real and which ones are just legends. In the end, since the author can't always verify the status of the creatures, he leaves it up to the reader to decide if they're real or not. So, what's the potential connection with Beowulf? Well, as I noted, the Liber Monstrorum was a book about monsters, which was compiled in Britain around the same time that Beowulf was probably composed. But more significantly, the text specifically mentions Higelach, who you might remember was Beowulf's uncle and king of the Geats in the Beowulf poem. I briefly discussed Higelach in the last episode. He was the king who led a raid against the Franks in Frisia and was killed in the battle. Well, in that episode, I noted that this raid is mentioned in several other historical sources from around the same time period. And I also noted that there was some confusion as to whether Heelach was a Gietish king or a Danish king. Almost all of the other historical sources say that he was a Danish king. But there are two sources, and only two sources, that say he was the king of the Geats. One of those sources is Beowulf, and the other source is the Liber Monstrorum. So, in the Liber Monstrorum, we have a text that was likely composed around the same time as Beowulf, and it mentions this obscure Scandinavian figure, Heelach. 
like Beowulf does. And it describes him as a Geet, like Beowulf does. And those are the only two known texts to do that. So all of these similarities have led some scholars to conclude that the Liber Monstruum may have been composed in the same scriptorium by the same scribes who composed Beowulf. Unfortunately, there's no way to prove any of that. But it's possible that a group of scribes somewhere in Britain in the late 600s or early 700s decided to collect and compile a bunch of stories about monsters. And both of these surviving manuscripts may have been part of that original collection. And that takes us back to a more fundamental question. Where did the story of Beowulf come from? It seems very likely that the poet who composed the poem pulled from earlier legends and stories. And it appears that those original stories also passed into the oral tradition of the Scandinavian people. And they were captured in writing many centuries later when the Norse tribes finally became fully literate. Earlier, I mentioned the Danish legend of Hrof Kraki, which has some similarities to the Beowulf story, and mentioned some of the same historical figures mentioned in Beowulf. It also contains a brave fighter named Bodvar Bjarki, who may have some connections to the character of Beowulf. So, some scholars think there may have been an original Scandinavian story or legend which inspired both of those stories. But there's an even more striking parallel to Beowulf in another Scandinavian legend, an old Icelandic saga from around the year 1300, and it has some amazing similarities with the story of Grendel and Grendel's mother in Beowulf. So let me give you a summary of the two stories and see if you can notice the similarities. Let's begin with a quick summary of the first two-thirds of Beowulf. Hrothgar is king of the Danes, and he directs the construction of a great mead hall called Herod. Every night, the hall is filled with revelry, and a monster named Grendel, who lives in a nearby lake, is driven to rage. One night, Grendel barges in and attacks the men in the hall, and he kills 30 of the men inside. Grendel returns over and over again and kills more of the Danes for several years. Meanwhile, in the land of the Geats, a brave and noble prince named Beowulf hears of the attacks. He prepares a ship and travels with a group of men to the land of the Danes. When they arrive, they are escorted to meet Hrothgar. Beowulf offers to assist the Danish king by killing the monster. That night, Beowulf and his men remain in the hall after everyone else leaves. Grendel storms into the hall, ripping the door from its hinges. He seizes and grips a sleeping warrior. He drinks his blood and consumes his body. But Beowulf seizes Grendel's arm. The two begin to grapple and fight. Beowulf eventually rips off Grendel's arm, which the poet describes as bursten bonloken, bursting bone locks. Grendel is mortally wounded and flees from the hall back to the lake. And Beowulf then places the severed arm above the mead hall door. Back at the lake, Grendel's mother discovers her dead son, and she vows to avenge his death. A few nights later, she travels to the same mead hall where the Danes were sleeping. And Beowulf was still there, but he'd been given lodging in a different location. So Grendel's mother makes her way inside the mead hall, and she unleashes a fierce attack upon the sleeping Danes, and she kills one of Hrothgar's warriors. Hrothgar and Beowulf soon arrive to see all the death and destruction, but Grendel's mother has already fled. So Beowulf decides to pursue her and kill her as well. They travel to the lake or the mare where she lives, which is full of snakes and serpents. Beowulf jumps in the water. He swims for most of the day before he finally reaches the bottom. Grendel's mother senses Beowulf's presence, and she reaches out and grabs him. She pulls him to her lair, where sea creatures begin to attack him. And the fight continues for a while before he finally finds a massive sword. He swings the sword at Grendel's mother and strikes her neck, killing her. The poet uses the phrase, Band ringes brak, bone rings broke. The men who had gathered by the shore see blood bubbling up from the bottom, and they assume it's Beowulf's blood, and they leave. Meanwhile, Beowulf, who's still in the lake, comes across Grendel's lifeless body and cuts off his head. And Beowulf then swims back to the top of the lake with Grendel's head in tow. 
And that concludes the second of the three battles in the Beowulf poem. Now, by comparison, here's a summary of a portion of the Icelandic Gretis saga. A female monster is threatening a farmstead. After each visit by the monster, a man is missing. One night, the mistress of the house leaves for church, and a man named Grettir stays behind in the main hall to see what type of creature is stalking the farm. Grettir barricades himself in the hall, and he lies down to rest. The monster arrives, and Grettir is attacked. The two begin to fight, and the fight extends outside to a deep gorge with a waterfall by a river. Grettir finally cuts off the monster's right arm with a knife. She then falls down into the waterfall. Later, Grettir tells the parish priest what happened. The priest doubts the story, so Grettir takes the priest to the waterfall. And there's a cave behind the waterfall. So Grettir jumps into the water and reaches the cave. And there, a giant is sitting beside a great fire, which is burning inside the cave. And the giant jumps up and lunges at Grettir, and the two begin to fight. The giant reaches for a sword hanging on the wall of the cave. And as he does so, Grettir seizes the opportunity and finally kills the monster. The priest, back on shore, sees gore rushing in the water. So he thinks it's Grettir's blood. So he gets scared and runs away. Grettir then returns to land, and he accuses the priest of not being faithful. Now, as you can probably tell, the basic events of both stories are the same. And even some of the details are the same. The hero cutting off the arm of the monster in the first battle. The sword which appears during the second battle. The blood which fills the water. The witnesses standing by the water who leave before the hero returns. It's unlikely that all of these similar details were the product of a coincidence. Most scholars today agree that both of these stories were influenced by a common legend which must have been floating around Scandinavia and which ultimately passed to Britain, possibly with the early Anglo-Saxon migrations. In the last portion of Beowulf, after he's returned home to the land of the Geats, a dragon is awakened by a thief who steals a cup from a treasure hoard which the dragon was guarding. The dragon retaliates by going on a rampage throughout the land of the Geats, killing people and destroying houses. Beowulf, who by now has been the king of the Geats for many years, goes off to fight the dragon. Ultimately, Beowulf slays the dragon with the help of a loyal thane, but not before receiving a fatal bite from the dragon. Beowulf dies, and his body is burned in a large funeral pyre. Now, the origin of this last part of the story is difficult to pinpoint with any certainty. And that's because fights against dragons and serpents were very common in Germanic folklore. One common belief was that the world inhabited by humans, the Middle Garden or Middle Earth, was surrounded by a primordial ocean, sort of like a large moat encircling the Earth. Remember that they didn't understand that the Earth was a planet. To them, it was more like a large island. And beyond that island was this circular ocean. And beyond that ocean was the outer world, which was inhabited by giants and other creatures. But in that ocean, which separated humans from monsters, was a huge serpent, which had been cast there by the gods. That same mythology purports to describe how the world will one day end in a great battle. Thor will end up fighting that giant serpent, and Thor will kill it with his famous hammer. So, some scholars think that Thor's legendary battle with the giant serpent may have been an ultimate source for some of these later tales which describe battles against dragons. But dragons and serpents weren't just Anglo-Saxon creatures. They're found in the folklore and literature of many ancient cultures. So, their ultimate origin is much deeper and much more ancient than the Germanic tribes. The word dragon is actually a Greek word, which meant serpent or sea monster. The word was later borrowed by the Romans, and English borrowed it from Latin twice. The first time was before English was English, back when the Anglo-Saxons were still living on the continent. During that period, the word was borrowed by the early Germanic tribes from the Romans. So Old English had the word as draca, and that's the version of the word used in Beowulf. Later, after the Normans arrived in 1066, English borrowed the French version of the word 
which was spelled exactly like the modern English version, D-R-A-G-O-N. So that word hasn't changed for nearly a thousand years. By the time of Old English, the concept of the dragon had evolved from its original notion as a serpent or sea creature to the more modern notion of a flying creature who could breathe fire. When the Anglo-Saxons wanted to describe a more traditional sea serpent, they would use the term sedraka, sea dragon. Sometimes they would call it a sadeir, which is literally a sea deer, which seems odd today, but in Old English, deer was a generic term for a wild animal. And in case you were curious, Old English had a different term for the animal which we know today as a deer. It was called a herret, which, by the way, is the name of that mead hall built by Hrothgar, where Beowulf battled Grendel. And that's because the name of the hall meant Hall of the Deer in Old English. Of course, today we don't use the phrase sea dragon or sea deer. Instead, we tend to use either serpent or snake. Snake is an Old English word, snaka, and Old Norse had a very similar version of the word. But serpent is a Latin word, borrowed from French immediately after the Normans arrived. The two words are not related, though. They each come from different Indo-European root words, though both root words did have the same meaning, to crawl or creep. The original root of snake also produced snail and sneak, which also relate to creeping or crawling. Similarly, asp and adder both mean a snake, but they also are not related. Asp is the Latin word from Old French, and adder is the Old English word, but again, they're not cognate. Adder is actually one of my favorite words because its modern form is the product of linguistic confusion. The Old English version of the word was nadra, and in some modern dialects of northern England, it's still pronounced as natter. So if you had one natter, you had a natter. But over time, people became confused, and they thought that it was an adder. So they thought the n was part of the article, not part of the noun. So basically, the n was shifted forward from the noun, natter, to the article, and a became an. And so it became an adder. The same thing also happened with words like apron, which was originally napron. And the same thing happened with the word umpire, which was originally French non pair. Old English also had some other words for monsters, which have long since disappeared. A wretched creature was sometimes called an arming. A giant was called an aten. Old English also had the word orc which was a type of monster. The source of the word is uncertain, but it's often connected to the Latin word ogre, which had a similar meaning. J.R.R. Tolkien revived the word orc, and he often used it as another word for goblin. It also appears to be the root of the word orca for a type of whale, specifically a killer whale, another type of sea creature. Another sea creature in Old English was a nikor. It was originally a water monster. And, in fact, the Beowulf poet uses the term Nikor to describe Grendel's mother at the bottom of the lake. Nikor is cognate with the word Nixie, which is a water fairy. Nixie is actually a very late borrowing from German. The Scottish poet and novelist Sir Walter Scott first used the term in English in the early 1800s. But it also came in through the Brothers Grimm around the same time. One of their stories was the Nixie of the Mill Pond. Another Germanic creature that found its way into the works of Tolkien and the Brothers Grimm was the troll. Troll is actually an Old Norse word, and in fact it still retains its original spelling and pronunciation. The word was deposited by the Vikings in the islands north of Britain, and it existed there from the beginning of the Viking period. But it didn't enter general English until around the 1800s, thanks to the works of the Brothers Grimm and other authors of the period. Another Old Norse word, which is directly related to monsters, goblins, and witches, is the word ugly, which originally meant frightful or horrible in appearance. I noted in an earlier episode that our modern ending li, L-Y, is derived from the word like. Well, ugly was originally uglika, ug-like, and it eventually became ugly. 
And before I conclude, I should note that Old French gave us the word monster, another word borrowed from the Normans within the first century after they arrived in Britain. It was derived from the Latin word monera, which meant to warn or remind. So that makes monster cognate with the word monitor. Since the original Latin word also meant to remind, it also makes monster cognate with monument. And it's also related to admonish and premonition. That Latin word minera was also used for the name of the goddess Juno Mineta, and her name gave us words like money and mint. So that makes those words cognate with monster as well. Monstrosity and demonstrate are also derived from the same Latin roots. And if we trace those same Indo-European roots back to Greek, we get other words like manic, mania, maniac, and maniacal. And even the word mantis, as in praying mantis, goes back to that same Greek root word. So all of those words are connected to the modern English word monster. They all come in via Greek, Latin, and French. So as we've gone through all of the names for the various creatures, you should have noticed an underlying theme. English has generously borrowed the names of monsters and creatures from other languages. And as always, the three main sources of those words are Old English, Old Norse, and Old French. So within these words, we can get a sense of how these three languages blended together. And as we move forward, the next four centuries of our history is really the story of how these three languages blended together to form Middle English and Modern English. And having looked at the history of Old English and Old Norse up to the end of the 8th century, we have to briefly turn our attention to the third leg of that tripod, Old French. So next time, we're going to explore how Old French emerged from Latin. And we'll also explore the rise of Charlemagne and the Carolingians, and the evolution from the Frankish kingdom to France. And you might be surprised how much the developments there impacted modern English. And with the conclusion of the next episode, we can then turn our attention back to Britain and the Viking invasions of the 9th century. So until then, thanks for listening to the History of English podcast. 